All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. April and Kathy, welcome back. Thanks for having us back. Thanks for having us back. That was a totally normal human interaction between the three of us. Um, no, I both of you have been on the show before. We've obviously had a lot of conversations. And I think the last couple of weeks, I've been really itching to have a conversation about Wilkerson, First Baptist Church of Hammond, like there's just been so much that's happened in a very short period of time. And then not even just with that, but with the extended IFB universe of Treber going on this little tour around all these conferences, like there's been a lot and I can talk about it ad nauseum, but I think there's a lot of perspectives. And the reason for anybody listening, the reason I had you come in April is because you've obviously been dealing with kind of boots on the ground with First Baptist Church of Hammond, with Wilkerson, organizing protests. And then, you know, Kathy, with your perspective, having gone to the protest, meeting Wilkerson with me, uh, or that's not even a good way to say it, dragging me into Wilkerson's office to meet with Wilkerson and me storming being- Storming the castle. Uh, yeah, storming the castle, <laughs> but taking me in and having a meeting with them and trying to give benefit of the doubt that maybe all the things I've heard for years about Wilkerson's different, he's like just trying to change things. He's a victim of the system kind of stuff that we've heard. He's really proved himself to be just like everyone else. And I wanted to kind of break down why I feel that way and- I'm assuming we kind of all have come to that perspective. I really want to go back to Let Us Pray coming out and then April, you organizing the protest, which prompted Wilkerson to give his first official public statement about these things. What did you think of Wilkerson's initial response that he read about Let Us Pray and about the, at that, at that time, upcoming protest? In my opinion, and maybe this is just because I've heard several statements now. I'm several years into hearing pastor's statements, but it just felt extremely prepared and calculated. It was very vague to the point of being purposely vague, in my opinion. Like It didn't really acknowledge anything specifically. It was very vague. um, And he even acknowledged or said that it was, he had a team. um, I forget what he called it. He called it something. a crisis team or something. I forget what it was called that helped, you know, he talked to these people, but even what he talked about, it was, it felt very much like he was trying to um, ease everybody's um, fears in the congregation without really saying anything at all. It was a lot of talking and not much, not much was actually said. It's important to acknowledge that any statement that we provide will never offer full healing to the mental, the spiritual, the physical, or the emotional harm that's been caused in 136 years of ministry by a few. We can't say enough about that. There's nothing we can say that will fix that. However, we want to be clear. Number one, we grieve and have great remorse for any victim. Of abuse. Number two, we abhor the abuse in any fashion. I hate it. It makes me sick. And it should make anybody who loves Christ uh, grieved. We acknowledge a lifelong harm that abuse has caused in the lives of people who have had it happen to them. It's not something to one and done. There are challenges that carry on for a lifetime. We are committed to providing a safe place for men, women, and children to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. According to our policies, I cannot speak for 13 decades of our ministry since 1887 and November the 28th when 12 people signed the charter, but I can speak to this current leadership that we have taken every allegation seriously and will continue to report any allegations of abuse to proper authorities. It is our firm belief that the church family should be a place where people are loved and accepted and where victims are supported. I believe what I shared with you is the consensus of any church member at First Baptist Church. It's not meant to be terribly specific. It's meant to be general and biblical. And I want to thank you, and I ask that you would stand with us as we attempt to continue going week by week, day by day, honoring our Lord Jesus Christ, loving him, 
and uh, loving others. I believe that God said if we love him and love others, it's the whole duty of man. That's a fulfillment of all the law. May God help us to do that. I feel like that kind of sums up like everything Wilkerson's done in the last couple of years is a lot of talking with nothing being done. And I, I know for me, the biggest issue I have with any of these statements, and I've gotten to read a lot of really crappy statements over the last couple of years explaining these things, is I always listen for how do they distance themselves from this? Mm-hmm. And the minute Wilkerson started going into, we've been here uh, several decades, 130 plus years, however long it's been, like I knew that there was not going to be anything substantive after that because he yeah. already had put himself into that's not my regime. That's not us. That's not the people here, even though many of those people have been there through all of that. It's, it was a really frustrating thing to see him not take ownership over the legacy of the church. And uh, we'll talk about it in a minute, but he's more than willing to take ownership of the legacy of the church when it comes to the good things they've done. Yeah. But when it comes to the bad things, it's, I didn't know, I didn't hear, I didn't see anything like that has nothing to do with me. Um, Kathy, from your perspective, I mean, as someone with connections to First Baptist Church of Hammond, as a survivor, as somebody who's dealt with Wilkerson, like, what did that statement mean to you specifically when you heard it? It was just super vague. You know, it's it's exactly what you said. They lump the bad into this history. It's not really us. It's this history that we carry on. Yeah. But then all the good is, but we did all this. So they only want to own the good parts. They don't want to own the bad parts. And, you know, that was obviously brought up in a conversation we had. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And we'll definitely talk about that. Um, Yeah. It's, it's, it it was interesting. Well, I'll I'll get into that into the past, but um, we have the protest in Indiana which was really a cool thing to see. It's one thing to see online, like, oh, there's this many people saying we support this, or there's this many people saying, you know, we want to do something. But that's another to see, I think like what, 70 people, 80 people in yeah, one it was spot a good crowd. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that are all doing the same thing, expressing the same thing, meeting people that I had met online in person. That was really neat to see. For the protest itself, I'm curious like what your biggest goal was like going out and actually meeting in person in front of the church and making it a visible kind of statement. Like what were you hoping would happen? Was it to affect Wilkerson? Was it to affect the people who are kind of on the fringe of the church? Like who were you, who'd you have your eyes set on in terms of like impact? That's a good question. I, I know I wrote a letter um, to John Wilkerson. I gave it, um, walked it to the office because, just to make sure that it ended up in somebody's hands. And my goal when I wrote that letter was to put out an offer of involving First Baptist Church. I asked um, uh, Pastor Wilkerson to come out and speak with survivors and the victims and to hear us. And obviously in his statement, he said that he didn't think that was a good idea. I have been asked and been given a paper and an open letter that's asked us to come and present ourselves to the protesters and stand there without saying anything and allow them just to tell us their their perspective of us and we're supposed to stand there and take their, their opinions of our church. I don't think it's probably the best um, plan and I don't think it's uh, what we're going to do. Uh, if any of them would like to talk to us and talk to our folks who handle this on a daily basis, we'll be glad to do that. But I think the open forum on the sidewalk is probably not the best way to do that. So we're not going to go that direction. I can't say that I was surprised about that. So I can't even say that that was the reason I did the protest, although I wanted it to offer it to them um, just to see if they would. But I can't say I was surprised. I would say really honestly, it was for the survivors and um, people who had been victimized by the church, any church, honestly, but by the ministries of First Baptist Church to be given a voice. And I would say that was my main, my main goal was I, I, I struggle with because I want to always be hopeful for a change, but consistently over the years, um, and I think we'll talk about that again, I just haven't seen that change. So I wasn't hoping that this would be the one thing that now First Baptist Church 
now decides, okay, we believe everybody because I think they would have done that years ago, but it was more of, I want to give the voice to the victims. I want them to be heard and I want them to be heard in a way that cannot be ignored. And that was, you know, among many things was one of the reasons I chose to do it on a Sunday. They can't ignore us on Sunday, right? We're there, we're front and center. Um, we're right at the front door, although they did try. I don't think anybody came out that front door. Um, but I wanted to be seen and I wanted us to be heard um, and to be listened to and yeah. give that that power back to survivors and victims. And then, I mean, we had people, one thing that really struck me, I had people from, I mean, from Las Vegas, Texas, Pennsylvania, people drove in overnight to be there from Missouri. Yeah. I'm going to start naming places and forget. I had people come from all over the U.S. Um, driving, flying last minute to come in. And I, it just struck me that the pastor of the church couldn't walk down the front steps to talk to us. But then victims showed up driving hundreds of miles, flying across the country because it was important to them. And it's just one of those things I, I really think if it was important, as we saw people show up and this was something that was very important to people and they showed up and made their voices heard, which is an incredible experience to see that and talk to people and just see how important it is and how passionate people are to bringing awareness about abuse in the church. Yeah. No, I, I think it, there was parts of this and I'm, and I think, Again, with what me and Kathy are going to talk about in a second, I think that there was this moment for me where it was like, either way, there's a win here. Like if Wilkerson sees this and he starts making those, you know, the bar is low steps, you know, into like, I'm going to go talk and see what we can fix or, hey, I'm going to sit down and actually listen to the things that have happened un under this ministry, even the things that he wasn't there for. I want to be aware so we can see who was involved in the past, who's still here that was involved or what can we change to make it feel safer? Like that would have been a big win and yeah. it would have proved that maybe he's not a bad guy. He's in a bad position. The other part of me was going, if he doesn't come out and if he gives a really bad statement and he chooses to actively ignore it, that's also a win because it shows he's everything that we're thinking that he is. So yeah. either way, we're going to walk away with some improved clarity. Uh, I did not expect to walk away with as much clarity as I did, because as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, Kathy drug me kicking and screaming into Wilkerson's office to to meet. Um, I, I half joke about that. You did drag me. I didn't kick and scream. I just quietly protested to you. Like, this is not going to be a good idea. Um, In fairness, I tried to make all of us go and you were the only one that was brave enough to go with me. So I will put that out there. I'll take, Thanks I'll take that badge of bravery. Um, no, I mean, in, in all honesty though, we're sitting at lunch after the protest, we're, we're talking through it and you say, I want to go meet with him. <laughs> what makes you go? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Even though we have all this cynicism that might be behind the scenes of everything up to that point, what was going through your mind at that moment? So for me, showing up to the protest, it was the second time. So the first time we did an impromptu protest during the filming of the documentary at Faith mm -hmm. Baptist. And to me, that was so empowering. Watching my stepbrother and his wife drive by, watching Sunday school teachers drive by, Bruce Goddard, and just not look at us or not say anything or or people yelling, go home. It's like, okay, you're choosing now to ignore what is right in your face. Because our signs were pretty solid that we were silenced yeah. and something bad had happened here. And so to me, that was powerful. Um, I initially was not going to come to the protest in Indiana because it was it was pretty impromptu put together, but I did end up coming because I just felt this pull to come. And it was amazing. Like all of these people coming out and standing there and holding up their signs. And it was so weird. All those people inside the church building, looking out the glass at us, like, mm. like we're the show on the street. I thought that was so weird, but the few people that did come by and say something were nice and respectful. Um, I didn't feel like, I felt like there was purposeful things happening to avoid us. Mm. 
Like mm-hmm. purposefully, people were going out back doors and side doors instead of the front door. Um, so it, to me, while it was super empowering and it was amazing to see victims standing there that maybe had never had a voice before, but felt brave enough to come because other survivors were there. Um, all of that was great. Law enforcement standing with us was great. There's just this element kind of missing for me. And I think when we were talking at lunch, someone said that Wilkerson said he would talk to any survivors. And I might have been April that said that. I don't remember. But I was like, I'll talk to him. And that kind of was just like, I just threw it out there. But I was like, let's do this. Come on. This is like a, our moment. I'm leaving in the morning. I'm flying back to Montana. So yeah. let's, let's talk to him. Yeah. I, I remember you saying that, like, when we were walking in the front doors, you're like, this is my last chance to do this. So I'm going to go do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it was like, I really was walking through the doors and you know this, cause I was kept saying it quietly to you as we're walking through, why are we doing this? It's a waste <laughs> of time. And, uh, and what I remember you saying, Eric is they're going to kick us out. And then we went to the front desk and I said, Oh yeah. Where's Pastor Wilkerson's office? She goes, Oh, just go up the stairs up around past the bookstore. I'm like, okay. And we're going up the stairs and you're like, I can't believe they're letting us go up the stairs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, th- yeah, that was interesting. Um, and then, yeah, but I remember telling you, like, I, I just, one, they're not going to meet with us. Two, it's going to be a waste of time. Like, it's going to be, a, and I've said, I, I've had these conversations before. I've, I've talked to Bob Gray on the phone, and it doesn't get more hard headed than that. Um, you know, it, it's, it was one of those things I was sitting there going, like, why do this? But like I mentioned, you walk away with a win either way. You get some more clarity on the, on the situation. So, I've shared my perspective for anybody that hasn't heard it. I shared my perspective on leaving Eden and kind of gave like a 30 minute diatribe about my experience meeting with Wilkerson. I'm curious for you purely from the emotional perspective, because we'll get into like the things that we listed out. Like, what did you feel meeting with him? Did you feel hopeful at first and then it changed? Did you feel cynical and then it changed? Like, what was kind of your emotional journey through that meeting? So, a little bit of a backstory. I, when I went to Hiles Anderson, his sister was my college roommate and she was the sweetest, most amazing, most godly girl. Like you would hide the things you were doing from her because she's just, she's going to, you know, do all the things right. And so I think I got a little bit of insight into his family and who they supposedly were. Plus I've heard throughout just being in the IFB that he was different and right. and he would never get to be first Baptist church of Hammond pastor because he's different. But then I also heard when he was candidating that he's more of a teacher and not a preacher and that's why they want him. And so to me, there's always been this thing that's different about him. And so I guess I just felt like, let me see for myself. Let me see if he's really as different as I think he is. And yeah. so to me, that was my, it didn't really matter what the outcome was going to be. I was going to be able to finally decide whether he's just like all the rest or if he really is different. And was that your first interaction actually speaking with him? No, or- I had met him um, once before at Goddard's church. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I can get into a sitting down. And again, people who are listening have heard me talk about some of these points, but I wanted to list them. And I think it's important just in light of what's happened in the last couple of weeks, because much of what we talked about in that meeting has come back up through (laughs) some things that have been said at the servants conference recently. But I mean, first and foremost, sitting down, kind of talking to him, the number one thing that I wanted to get out when I finally decided to talk and, and for the record, I didn't plan on saying a word when we were in there originally and um, sit there and and support you. Yeah. I'll be a silent observer of this, but the minute you start hearing for me, the minute that I heard you starting to pour your heart out about all these things. And I started hearing the canned answers from him and the kind of like dismissive cordial attitude where it's like, oh, that's so, you know, oh, sweet girl. When I started hearing that kind of political, like, I'm so sorry, 
that was this, that was that. I just can't help but start wanting to say things. And when I started talking, the number one thing that was on my mind was you're getting ready to host a conference with David Gibbs and Jack Treber. Like if you're different, like why are you hosting two people who, I mean, David Gibbs held fundraisers for guys like Bill Weininger, who was a horrible sexual abuser. There's several different people in IFB history with Jack Hiles that Gibbs was a very active part of like supporting the wrong side of that, of that story. Then you have Jack Treber who it's a poorly kept secret that everybody in the IFB knows that Jack Treber covered for his brother-in-law sexually abusing somebody and getting Mm -hmm. a girl pregnant. Like I said, there's a clear story there. And his response was, I hadn't heard that, you know, that was like his go-to for everything. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, did, did you have any thoughts on that specifically? I know that um, I know that you said something specific about Gibbs to him that came from your own personal experience, but I did. I I felt like we were getting the same kind of IFB line of, well, I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know those things. How was I going to know those things? And he even said at one point, like, well, you have access to records that I don't. And I'm like, yeah. They're on the internet. Just Google. Like, yeah. it's not hard. It's all public record. You know, when I went to Pastor Goddard in, in oof, 1992 and told him that I was being abused, he immediately called David Gibbs. Now, David Gibbs ended up being out of town. And so Charlie Craze, who was David Gibbs' partner, was the one that ended up handling the initial few days of my abuse. But David Gibbs did come back into the picture shortly. Um, because I think, you know, Bruce Goddard was one of those well-known churches that David yeah. Gibbs himself wanted to have a hand in. But the call that I got from Charlie Craze, which is from Christian Law Association, which is owned by David Gibbs, was if you want to press charges, we will not be supporting you because you are a layman. We only protect pastors. And we're going to make you look horrible and we're going to drag your name through mud if you want to sue. And that that was from Christian Law Association to me yeah. at 17. <laughs> so to me, David Gibbs perpetuates covering up for these pedophiles. And so if you have him speak in your church, you are for covering up for pedophiles if they happen to be ministry people. Yeah. And that doesn't sit right with me. Having right. Bruce Goddard in your pulpit doesn't sit right with me. And nor does Jack Treber because he is him and Goddard are just like, you know, Siamese twins. Um, right. So I felt like we were just getting really vague, vague, vague answers of like, well, I didn't know. And that's information you had and not me. And that is very much an IFB line with every pastor. Goddard yeah. is famous for don't tell me the details because then he can say he doesn't know. No. Yeah. Well, no, here it is. Now what? No. Well, and Wilkerson probably has more access to a lot of this than any of us mm-hmm. would. Um, but yeah, and I think it's easy for people to gloss over. And this kind of the problem of even doing these episodes is like you start getting numb to like how crazy some of this stuff is because it's just like one thing after another. But like for people listening, I hope that really sinks in when you hear like, Hey, we're going to stand by the church. Like we're going to toe the party line. That's what we do. It's not, we're going to do what's right. It's we're going to stand with the church. And if you come against the church, then you're enemy number one. Like that to me is a really horrific and scary thing, but we've seen it play out for throughout the history of first Baptist church of Hammond, the IFB, all the churches in that orbit, like that's been what has happened. (laughs) And I've talked to, I haven't just talked to you. That's told me things like that. I've talked to many different people who've been in that position. There's, there were two pivotal moments for me in that conversation with, with John Wilkerson. One, when I went in and I said, look, I was college roommates with your sister. I don't know if you remember me. We met at Goddard church. I wanted him. I wanted him to be familiar to me, like on his end. And if he thought of his sister, Oh, okay, maybe there'd be some connection there or something. Because I really yeah. wanted like the authentic him, not the guarded him yeah. about, you know, oh, you're a protester. What is this about? Um, 
So for me, like I put that out there and I said, also, I said, you to me have always been different. You are not like the normal IFB preacher. And, Mm -hmm. but what I'm seeing right now is you're not any different. Where are you different? You say you handled this different. Where have you handled this different? And and we tried to get him to name some things. He did tell us that we could look at ha- uh, in writing how they, um, their policies on child abuse and stuff. But obviously we didn't see those. Um, I, he, he specifically asked at one point, what do you want from me? Or what do you want me to do? I forget how he worded it, but I said, and that, I think this is when we brought up the conversation about, um, you know, that you're having this conference and David Gibbs is going to be there and Jack Treber is going to be there. And I said, I want you to get up in front of your church congregation, get up in your pulpit and say, Bruce Goddard is my friend, but he will never be in this pulpit because he is covered for sexual abuse, you know, of, of predators. Jack Treber will never be in this church because he has covered for predators. David Gibbs will never be in this pulpit. Even if they're your friends, they'll never be in this pulpit because of what they've done. And he he immediately said, oh, sweet girl. And I was just like, okay, well, this is a lost cause because no. obviously that's not going to happen. But that's what I wanted. I wanted to prove that he was different. No. Yeah. yeah. Was- and I don't know if you remember this, but this is something that kind of stood out to me as well. And it goes back to the party line kind of approach of you're not with us, you're against us kind of mentality is somewhere in the conversation. It, my faith came up and I know you mentioned like you, you mentioned that to him. And I remember he kind of turned to me and was like, well, what do you want since you're not even a believer? And I remember kind of sitting there going like, oh boy, like if we're at a point where the things that we're asking for are just legitimately just like, this is a wise thing to do, like take away the moral thing to do, take away the legal thing to do, take away like the, all those things, you know, and just focus on the appear like the appearance of the church or like the, the, uh, like a little bit of safety in the church. Like there's so many layers in which like, why are we getting into this layer? But it, it was clear to me in that, that he kind of wrote me out of that conversation of like, mm-hmm. what you're asking doesn't matter. And I, I literally used this verbiage. I want you to draw a line in the sand mm-hmm. and I want you to name Goddard, Treber and David Gibbs. Say whatever you want. They're my oh. friend, but they will never be here for this reason. Yeah. And he's unwilling to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it was and even and even in the um like when he made his statement before there was verbiage of the protesters out there. He even said we don't know their intention. It was they it put it them versus us. It wasn't yeah. we're, these are people who are trying to make our church safer. These are people who want to see it was I don't know their intentions. I don't think they're bad, but I we should feel, I think we can be safe with them. And it's like, what in the world? Like, you know, I even, I had posted, um, but somebody gave me a letter, dear victims. And again, all the languages it's you're the victim. And then we're over here. And I don't, I don't get that. Like you said, like, it just seems like common sense. Like at the end of the day to be like, like the, the, the bottom line, I mean, bottom of the shelf, we could just, be on the same team and it's still very us versus them language or you're over here. We're over here, not on the same page. Yeah. It's Um, literally like a, to whom it may concern kind of approach where it's like the meme of like, you know, happy for you or sorry that happened or whatever, you know, it's like, Mm -hmm. it's like whatever you need to hear, here it is. And, um, you know, even, even asking, what do you want me to do? And I'm like, you're a pastor of a massive church. Why are you asking me these things? Like that's, you can, like you said, go, all those resources are yours to get. I mean, you can, why are we're, we're telling you, it's like one of those things. I wrote you a letter. I told you what you, we wanted. We wanted you to talk with us out there. And then to turn that, it's just kind of very dismissive, but also putting it back. Like, this is your problem. Yeah. Not, not that, not that, but what else, what else do you want? And exactly. I think, I think that drawing a line in the sand was, was huge. And I, and 
you know, I mentioned that to him too with Treber. I said, um, you know, if you got clear evidence, I would hope you'd withdraw. Like if you mm-hmm. got clear public allegations, which he ended up getting, you know, I would hope that you would withdraw him from a speaker. And and his response to that, that's when he was saying, I'll probably never know as much as you guys know. That was like, he kept also, going back to that. You have to remember that he got the evidence and then still introduced him as he's mm-hmm. done everything right. He stood for right. He's done right. Everything's right, right, right. Yeah. So I did everything right and they indicted me. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it, it, he was very much in that realm of just it, ignorance was a shield. And I, that's the last thing I said in the meeting was you can't use ignorance as a shield. And he continued to do that. And you know, one of the things that, that stuck out to me in terms of like this, like partisanship with the church is whenever you criticize the church, Whenever you criticize a IFB church anywhere, people will say you're broad brushing and you're mm-hmm. saying that everybody in the church is bad. And something I've been thinking about a lot over the last several months has been like, people will tell me, oh, you don't believe there's any good people in the IFB. For me, I think like what I do kind of proves the opposite. I think there's a lot of good, innocent people in the IFB. And those are the people standing out on the sidewalk now because they're no longer allowed in the church. They're the ones in protest lines. They're the ones that are doing podcasts or going on documentaries and sharing how they were cast out of their church for being a victim of the church. So Mm -hmm. like whenever someone wants to say, oh, it's broad brushing the IFB as a whole, what they're doing is they're discounting whether or not those people were actually part of the church to begin with. And it's the reason you have the people like when you're on the protest line and you're looking in the window at literally what looks like mannequins in suits and dresses saying, okay, well, that's the church, but a Kathy or an April or fill in the blank with 70 plus other people represented there, they were never part of this yeah, because they were, they were victims because they were different because they said something about it because they're like... To me, that is like the epitome of this kind of bipartisan or this partisan attitude where it's like, okay, everybody in the church is clearly okay with the abuse happening. And if you're not in it, then you're not part of our group. Yeah. And like that was, that was something that really stood out crystal clear to me is like, whenever that broad brushing thing comes up, I'm like, so who is like at Wildemar, like you mentioned, it's like, who is Kathy? <laughs> like mm-hmm. to you, like, was she not an innocent person in the church? Like, was she not? one of you guys like and then why is she here now and well, it's down kind of the like, line it's always the the gate what is it called the <laughs> goalpost that's always moved hmm. so if you're in the church and you speak out you're not supposed to pe- speak out because you don't talk about about people in the church so then you kind of move outside the IFB and then well you can't talk about it because you're not in the church you shouldn't talk about the people in the church yeah. what if do you, you want? Out you're a, not a believer now you're yeah <laughs> yeah you were never a true believer you were never and it's always the goalpost is will always be moved and it's kind of like it's it's flipped and i don't know how to say this exactly but like if you're like doing science, whatever you're, you're, you should ask the question and then follow the information to whatever conclusion that the inf- the facts lead you. They do it backwards as they've made the decision and they will just manipulate anything to fit that decision. And so that's why I, you can't convince somebody who has already arrived at that conclusion that their church is different. We're good. So if you bring information forwards that says hey well then you must be wrong you must have an ulterior motive or narrative and it will always and so i think that's where i kind of get to the point like i don't necessarily feel like it's for the people in the church because you can't convince somebody of something they've already decided in their mind it's almost for the people like you said the people who have had to step out and we're we're presenting it one because we want this place to be a safer place, but we're either presenting it to the people who are already questioning it, or to the people who've already stepped outside those walls, yeah. um, because the ones that have decided that this is the way it is, you cannot convince them of it. 
yeah, anything yeah. different. So, right. Yeah. I can tell you the minute you step, the minute something happens to you that's a problem for the church, or the minute you start to pull away from the church, you're no longer part of the church. And I remember that being very clearly told to me when Pastor Goddard came to me and said, we can't call the authorities because we might lose the bus ministry. They would investigate the church. You don't want to lose the church. You don't want the church mm. to be investigated. You don't want to lose your Christian school. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't want that. But it didn't occur to me in that moment, being 17 and traumatized, and I had just spilled my guts to Goddard that, wait a minute, aren't I the church? Like, it didn't mm -hmm. occur to me then. Now, looking back, I'm like, well, if the people in it aren't the church, then who's the church? So you you can't have it both ways. You can't say you're protecting the church and then not protect the people in the church because yeah. that is the church. Yeah. yeah. And has there ever been a better opportunity for a pastor to say, we're going to leave the 99 sheep for the one, like when all the preaching you hear about that stuff. Yeah. And that's, that's where, you know, and we can go into what happened at servants conference, but like, that's one of the things in the conversation with Rick Sparks, it's like, there's a lot of money spent. There's a lot of scheduling done. There's, you know, and then Goddard's statements, like we're going to lose the bus miss. We're going to lose this. It seems to me a man of God would say, yeah, let's lose all that money. Mm -hmm. Let's lose all that time. Let's waste all that time we spent scheduling. Like we booked their hotel. We can't refund it. Like all those things that go into doing the conference or we're going to lose our school. But it's better to not have a school than to have a school where kids are abused. Like, yeah. it's, but you it, would reach so. I mean, if, oh, yeah. if Wilkerson had got up there on the next Sunday or that night or whatever and said, "All right, I've I've prayed about this, and I think this is the right thing to do. We are not having Jack Trever at our conference. We'll get someone else to fill in, but mm -hmm. this is why." And he took a stand. He would reach far more people yeah. than, than I would have been pumped. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the thing is, you know who's speaking right now is <laughs> people who grew up hearing these things. Mm -hmm. You stand in the gap. You do the right thing no matter what. Even if the whole world, it's like someday I'm going to write a thank you letter to these pastors. Like, thank you for beating this into me because this is literally what I'm doing. You're the one who told me, you be the David against the Goliath. Yeah. It, it, even if nobody else stands with you, you go out there. But then it's flipped. I don't know. It's so bizarre because it makes sense to us because this is literally how we grew up. We were trained that you do the right thing no matter what, except it message, only worked. The message has message. not changed. It's the, the message. Same message. Positive. They're just not following their own advice. Yeah. Nice. So we're, we're doing it and they're not doing it. And it's become quite obvious how hypocritical they are. Yeah. I told someone the other day, I said, um, cause they were asking about like leaving the IFB. And I said, I think it's one of those rare things where I can say fundamentalism and fundamentalist thinking in that moment saved me was that I was taught to think in black and white and mm -hmm. stand up for what I believe in no matter what. And so when I was presented with a black and white of like, this is how they handle sexual abuse cases. That's a pretty clear black and white. Mm -hmm. They taught me that black and white. Cause they talk about Catholics all the time. Yeah. Like, okay, all of a sudden, this is the right side to stand on this issue. And I think that is like, again, what, what you just said is like, there's nothing's changed. Like standing up for what's right is good. Standing up in when nobody else will is good. The old banner that used to be in our Christian school, uh, you know, that said what's right is not always popular. What's popular is not always right with the little fish swimming, one fish swimming the opposite way. And it's like, I'm doing the things you taught me you just never believed what you taught. Like mm -hmm. it was always about what's Control. popular within yeah. our movement. Like, yeah. And it's about controlling because it's always do what's right. And they, they're the ones who setting what's right from the pulpit. So then it ultimately, if it's not what you actually believe, because you're going to push back when people actually do what's right, then it wasn't ever about what was right. It's about controlling people. So we covered a lot of like main actionable things. Like we left him with several. And I even mentioned uh, like Bob John. I said, because he asked, what do you want me to do? And then I even mentioned like, it's not really even my place to tell you. But I know in the past, like 
um, it's where I mentioned like you're, you embrace the heritage of the past. Like you've got, I was looking behind him in the meeting where he said, I don't think we live in the past. And I'm like, you have a picture of John R. Rice on your wall right behind you. And I went to the bathroom and there's rows of 12, 13 pastors, except for one in uh, Miles Anderson history and first Baptist <laughs> history. Um, you know, it was like, put that same energy toward this. You know, you've got statues of a Jack Hiles. Mm-hmm. You've got books about Miller Road Baptist Church, about David Hiles uh, ministry in your bookstore, still available online to purchase. Like there's a lot of things you could easily do. And I mentioned the grace report for Bob Jones years ago, where they said, put a memorial up for victims who've been harmed, like mm-hmm. which Bob Jones never did. And First Baptist will never do. Mm-hmm. But it's like, here's some simple things. But ultimately start with, hey, I'm not going to have speakers in who have these affiliations. And so for those keeping score, we told him about Jack Treber and the cover up there. I have a link in the show notes where people can get that full story. We talked to him about David Gibbs, which is plenty of links in the show notes with links to all those stories. Easily findable, by the way. One of the last things I talked about was David Baker, who, for those that don't know, David Baker is partnered with David Hiles doing restoration ministries, which are what they sound like. They work to restore predators. uh, I mean, well, that's the main one, predators into positions of power in churches. So David Baker is very publicly supportive of David Hiles. David Hiles, who FBC has distanced themselves from over the last couple of years. And so I mentioned to Wilkerson, hey, you were on a podcast with David Baker David Baker was actively partnered with David Hiles when he did the podcast and still is. Shortly after Wilkerson was on, like two episodes later, David Hiles did an episode on the podcast. And his response to that, and Kathy, I'm so glad I had you there as a witness, was, I did not know that. He said, David Baker asked me to come on to talk about the loss of my son. I agreed to do it. I did not know about his affiliations. I probably should have done a little bit more research about that. Thank you for letting me know that. He said, I, and he said, I probably wouldn't have done that podcast. But I don't think that's true because he did say that. I don't think that that's true because him knowing about David Gibbs stopped nothing. Him no. knowing about Jack Treber stops nothing. So I think he can say that, but that's yeah. not how he would have responded. Yeah. Yeah. And he he legitimately said, I would probably not have gone on his podcast. Mm-hmm. I would have, I should have done my research into the, and. That's what he said. That's relevant. Remember that information. (laughs) I feel like from my perspective, from that conversation, I begged him to be different. Like everyone thinks you're different. Be different. Show us that you truly are different, that you are doing things different and draw a line in the sand. These are the things we want. And he was unwilling. So he is not any different. Like you said, I wanted to leave going. He is different. He's quirky. The church is quirky. There's some weird things. I wouldn't go, but he's a good dude in a weird setting, Mm -hmm. but I didn't walk away with that feeling. I walked away going, this guy's a great politician. I, I also felt like he did not see himself as the head of the IRB. And my thinking on that is they've separated maybe a little bit. They still, you know, there's more Bible colleges now. So you have variety in where you can go. Not everyone goes to Hiles, but being that that was Jack Hiles church and you now sit in his spot, which is what I said to him, like literally you are the head of the IFB and you are responsible for the things that have happened in the past that have not been made right. And that is, that was my verbiage to him was that he he had made that statement about the protest and be kind and let them do their thing and whatever, but he hadn't apologized for any of the hurt that any of us had experienced. Now he did bring up in that meeting, well, did you listen to what I said this morning? Meaning Sunday morning in church, he had said, supposedly, cause I didn't go back and listen to it, that the protesters out there have been hurt by this church mm-hmm. and you know, we love them and care about them and whatever. And we're sorry. I don't know what he said. He said, he said something like that, but the fact that he does not, is not willing to take ownership of the atrocities that have happened at that church that he is now comfortably sitting in is infuriating to me. Mm. I wanted him to be different so badly, but he's not, he's just not. They're all the same. Right. 
Right. Well, I'm, I'm curious, like then fast forwarding on to the next protest. So Surfing's conference is, was barreling down the tracks. We're like, Treber's still going to be there. Gibbs is still listed to be there. Like, it doesn't look like any of this took hold at all. Um, we get closer and closer. April, you're prepping for the, the protest. And you decide to go. You got that crazy uh, idea that Kathy had, which is, I'm going to go meet with Wilkerson. I'm going to hand deliver a letter from myself. I ended up writing a letter as well, and then you had the copy of the lawsuit against Treber, which details some pretty horrific and easily verifiable things um, to Wilkerson himself. You're not able to meet with Wilkerson. Who did you speak to, and what did you hand to them? What message did you pass on, and, and so on? Yeah, well, I brought everything because I want to be... You know, there's always this, oh, we didn't get it in time. Like I could have emailed it or whatever, but I wanted to like hand it to somebody, look them in the eye and say, I can verify it made it into your hands. And so when I went, I went up about the same time as you guys did. I thought, oh, maybe I can get in there. And I, they were having prayer meeting for the servants conference, um, uh, which is what used to be pastor school, but they're having a prayer meeting. So the irony is not lost on me that they were praying over this conference and I'm walking in with um, like very graphic details about one of their divine their intervention. <laughs> I think I was walking in. in. <laughs> so um, I went up there and I walked up. I said, you know, am I able to talk to pastor Wilkerson and oh, he's, you know, he's doing prayer and all this stuff. And then um, it was Rick Sparks. He, he looks at me and he's like, I know you, who are you? I said, well, my name's April Abula and um, you might know my family um, who attends First Baptist or whatever. And he's like, no, no, I know you. And it's immediately, it's always the, the very, hey, sister kind of thing. But anyways, he said, can I help you? What is this about? So I handed it to him. I said, you know, exactly. I wrote this letter, open letter. And I, I tried to be very upfront, you know, I don't want them to be like, oh, we were blindsided. I told them, I said, I'm going to be posting this as soon as I get home. Here's a letter or the next day or whatever. And here's a letter from Eric. And that will also be posted. I just wanted to make sure you guys had it first before it was posted publicly. Um, And then I detailed what happened, you know, that we had come or you and Kathy had come and spoken to um, John Wilkerson several months ago. Here was the evidence of what they were speaking about. And, and I asked that, um, I said, I was, I'm here to ask that um, Jack Treber be asked to step down from the, the conference. And he's like, oh, you know, it's, you know, there's a lot of planning that goes into that. And which is, again, it's one of those things. It's like, yes, but this was brought to you three months ago. And right. anyways, it was just, it's the same, it's same conversation, you know, I don't think there's anybody more polite face to face, like more politically just smooth talker than an IFB person in their, their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you know, one of the things he said to me, he's like, April, I want to ask you a question and you know, I want your honest opinion. He's like, can you say that there has not since you left the church, which now it's been almost 10 years, you know, can you tell me honestly that there has not been a, that John Wilkerson has not made a lot of changes? And it was so funny because I walk into that church and I could have closed my eyes and been right back where I was 10 years ago. Like literally nothing felt different. There's college students still sitting at the little tables waiting for church to start. There's people sleeping where they probably been on their bus routes all day and they're sleeping in the corner. And it was funny too, because I was looking at him and then right behind him was this guy standing at the, the door kind of guarding it, I guess. And this guy sends me hate messages, like to the point I had to block him and there he is and his suit and tie. And I told him that I said, you know, you asked me if it's different. I said, it doesn't feel different. I said, you know, that person right behind you sends me hate messages for doing a protest. Um, you, I met with John Wilkerson, my husband and I, before we left, and we asked him, like, we need to see changes. And John Wilkerson told 
told my husband and I, give me 10 years and you'll see these changes. And I said, and here I am 10 years later and I don't see anything different. Mm. I, and you know, so I brought that up and everything. And again, it's the same thing. First it was like, well, he's different. He's not like everybody else. And then the next thing was, um, well, you know, there's, there's, it's an uphill battle. You know, he's, he, he has to work against the whole IFB and, you know, you know, we're not all connected and everything. So it's just the same. It doesn't matter who you talk to. It's kind of the same, same verbatim message over it's everybody just says the same thing. So it was, I mean, it wasn't a productive conversation um, by any means, but I'm glad I went because I'm glad I was just able to connect you know, oh, and then he told me they would pray about it too. He did say they would pray about it, which again is kind of just goes over my head. Like there's some things like I might pray about, and then other things you're kind of like, should we platform people who protect abusers? Does not seem like something you even need to pray about. I feel like yeah. that's pretty clear cut. But you know, it was it was it was just interesting. Like I I did bring up, I told him, you know, like there was um like I, and I posted about it, but in the Spanish department, I, I got death threats from a Sunday school teacher in the Spanish department. And I See, brought that's that up. One of those things we can gloss over. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope people have heard that you got yeah. death threats from, from a Sunday, Sunday school, school teacher, teacher in the Spanish. From my son, yeah. From my Sunday school teacher in the Spanish department. And he's like, oh, yeah, I dealt with that personally. And, you know, he's not allowed. And see, we're making changes. But then my mind puts the statement I heard John Wilkerson say from the pulpit three months prior when that was going on. Well, we don't even know if that's somebody who still goes to the church or if it's the right. It was very dismissive. We're told today of even one of our members, uh, whether it might have been not him, maybe somebody else, but but uh, had had a threatening manner toward the victim and it's been investigated by the police and it should be. We have no interest in being aggressive or threatening or things of that nature. From the pulpit, it's a very distancing language. It's not, we believe the victim, this person um, had to go to the police because somebody was sending her death threats very, to the point, I mean, the police believed me, the police took it very seriously, but the church didn't. And then, but then I think, oh, maybe, maybe Pastor Wilkerson didn't get the, the right information. He didn't get the memo, but then Oh, I'm over here talking to this person. He's like, oh, we dealt with that. And it's just this constantly one thing from the pulpit, one thing face to face, and they don't match up. And again, I told him, I said, well, you know, I finished up everything. And I said, you know, <laughs> I said something I grew up hearing, yay for Pastor the Pirate. I said, but I had this drilled in my head, you know, the whole your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. I said, I grew up hearing that, hearing it from the pulpit. And I said, I'm tired of hearing things. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of hearing that we're different. John Wilkerson's different. I said, I need to see some action. I want to see some actual, like, I want to see these things happen in real time. Not they will happen or we're doing these vague things. I want to see it. Yeah. And it was like, oh, you know, and then, yeah, we'll pray about it. So yeah, it's, what it's, strikes me, what strikes oh. me is so candidly right here in this moment is how hypocritical the IFB is. If you think about how many times, especially April for you and me at Goddard's church, growing up, we heard you are who you hang around. You mm -hmm. are who your friends are come out from among them and be used separate. All these things that were used to keep you separated from any bad things and people you shouldn't hang around, but it's okay to have a, a pastor come preach at your conference that covered up for pedophiles, people that hurt minors. I do not understand that. How come that's okay, but you hanging out with a teenager hanging out with their neighbor kid who smokes is not okay? Yeah. That's, I told not, them. that's, not, that's not okay. Be separate. Come out from among them. Yeah. But I, as the pastor, can have friends that cover up crimes. Yeah. And I told them that. I told them, I said, I'm just going to say I said, if um, Jack Trebers in the pulpit, I said, <laughs> again, there was this statement and um, John Wilkerson saying, oh, we, we, you know, been ministered to millions and mil he literally said millions and millions of people. I don't know that there's a church in history that has had more people come to its property than First Baptist Church of Hammond, apart from maybe the Vatican. 
And so I kind of put that back out there. I said, your ministry is one of the biggest IFB ministries and you are reaching millions of people. And it's like, yeah, they like that. It's, you know, yes, yes, we are. And I said, so who you platform is, is an endorsement and seen by millions of people. I said, and we're taking that as an endorsement. So if that person's in your pulpit, that's an endorsement of that person and their ministry, which yeah. John Wilkerson just took it a little further and literally endorsed them. But <laughs> that's right. a whole thing. Yeah. Well, and there's so much with your story, with Kathy, with your experiences, with my conversation, like the amount of cognitive dissonance of, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, just look at some of the statements you said, which was, you know, Wilkerson is different, but he's fighting an uphill battle. But then on the flip side, it's the church has done things right historically Mm -hmm. since, since he took over or or you'll hear statements like, hey, the IFB is not all bad, but the, um, you know, it, it, it's it's like, okay, which one is it? Is it the IFB is an uphill battle because there's such mm-hmm. an issue with this that uh, exactly. Wilkerson struggles to battle it? Is it, oh, Wilkerson has changed things and everything's okay now? Because like, depending where you're at, like I've heard all the statements, like he's trying to steer the ship, but he doesn't want to break the boat in half is like mm-hmm. something I heard years ago. And it's and that's like, what we heard when we were there ten years ago. It's the same right, same and rhetoric. Basically, a reason to get stuck in this loop, you know, where it's like mm-hmm. we can stay here and be comfortable here because that's where we ultimately want to be. Like for whatever yeah. reason, and that's the part none of us will ever understand. They want to be in this in this spot. So Sunday, March seventeenth, you try to meet with Wilkerson. You give the information to Rick Sparks instead. He lets you know we're praying about it. You don't really hear anything till Tuesday. And we were kind of sitting there texting going, is Treber going to be there? Like, we haven't heard anything. Uh, I wasn't even sure if they were going to live stream the service. I was surprised they did. Um, but they did. And I turn on the live stream. I sit through a lot of really boring things. And then Wilkerson says, hey, we're going to have Jack Treber up. I'll play the clip here in a second. But he goes out of his way, not only to say, Hey, we're having Treber speak, but he makes a point to say that Jack Treber pastors the great North Valley Baptist church. And he has always done the right thing, the right way for the right reason. And to me, I just flash back to telling him like, Hey, this is a slap in the face to Mm -hmm. survivors and people who are concerned about these issues. Like, that was a direct slap in the face to everybody who had, again, just two weeks before heard a very public story mm-hmm. from a survivor from Treber's church for people that had read the lawsuit for people that knew this information and all the people that knew this story for, I mean, I knew this when I was in the IFB, people yeah. talked about it. Mm-hmm. It was like a very well-known thing. We're so glad to have with us, Dr. Jack Treber. And uh, he is someone that we love very much, and I'm very grateful for his presence here. And of course, he's the pastor of a great, uh, a great church, North Valley Baptist Church. He has stayed there doing the right thing, the right way, for the right reason for many, many years. What did we think about that verbiage? Is there any uh, any specific thoughts on him uh, chatting about? So beyond? many thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I um, believe you said that. Yes. I'm like okay. Well, for the first statement, when in was it December or whatever? I felt like that one was very vague, like purposely vague. This statement felt very intentional, like, because I was very, you were as well, very intentional when we wrote the letter saying what we wanted, what we expected. I even put in my letter, like, I I believed it was a moral decision, like to not platform this person. Like I was very clear on my thoughts as a survivor on just generally platforming this person. And it was, to me, it felt like such an intentional statement. It wasn't vague, you know, like these apologies, like when talking about victims, it's vague, but vague. But when I was talking about Treber, it was, you know, great ministry. He's always done that stuck out to me so strongly. He's always done the right thing. And this is literally, I had, given him evidence that said the exact opposite, that he had not done the right thing, that he had covered up this abuse. I mean, we just had the whole situation with Cameron Giovanelli and how Treber handled that or didn't handle it right 
Like we just had that happen. That is recent history. And so to make the statement that, you know, he's always done the right thing for the right reason, again, felt incredibly intentional. Like he was making a statement, um, not just about Treber, but about the people they platform and how they view the their pulpit and the people they put behind it. They were making a statement. So yeah. that's how I took I think he did exactly what I asked him to do. And he drew a line in the sand. Line it just wasn't where we thought he should draw it. Oh, that's yeah. so good. He made a, he made a point. Oh, you said that. Yeah. That's, yeah. No, that's perfectly said. It was yeah. too pointed to not be purposeful. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and you mentioned April, like Chuber and his message talked about like the trials that they had gone through and, and all this sort of stuff. The devil tried to resist every way for me to come. But, but you know, God let me come. And I don't know if he let me come for you. But I think God has spoken to my heart so powerfully about this leg of the journey more than ever has got to be prayer. I, I've been praying on my prayer list. I promise you I will close. One of the saddest pages I have are the backsliders in our church. They love me and I love them, but they're backsliders. Some haven't come for years. When I see them, they'll always be, they're almost all the time, they'll be nice to me. Almost all the time, they're very gracious to me. But you know how it hurts your heart when you see people you love backslide? Not long ago, I created another list. It's an awful list. It's those that are church members or professors across the country, not just church, that I think are lost. Lost. And I've got so many names on there. The Bible says this in Matthew 5, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And when someone lives their life in division, and causing problems. I don't believe they know the Lord. I just don't believe they know the Lord. God doesn't give you that spirit of hatred. God, I've seen that so many times. Sermons. I know. Yeah. I, my mind that you can <laughs> I have to. I put myself in a position I have to watch and download in 2x speed. Um, and <laughs> yeah, a lot of 2x speed. Um, but then there was also like comments on Facebook from Cindy Treber saying, thanks for loving my husband. Like they're not saying it, but they're saying it. One of the telling things that Wilkerson said at the end was he called Tre- Treber a friend to God's men. And he's a friend to God's men. And I'm very thankful to have him here. And again, drawing on that line in the sand, which I'm so glad you called that back. Cause I wouldn't have drawn those two things together. Like, he really was just saying like, you're one of us. And Mm -hmm. I think all of the verbiage that was used around it, I I think it goes beyond just me inferring that because I'm like a tinfoil hat conspiracy. Like Mm -hmm. these guys are all buddies and that is the absolute driver of the decisions they make is you are a friend to God's men. The people out on the curb with signs are not friends to us. They're enemies to us because they're not one of us. And like, it couldn't be more clear. And to me, it was the moment where, you know, maybe I'll regret saying this on a podcast, but like, it's the moment where I immediately felt like, okay, I officially consider myself gloves off with Wilkerson. Mm -hmm. And I think I texted you that April when he said that, like it's, and, and I mean that in the sense of, I don't have any more like, oh, maybe he's different and I'm misunderstanding him. Maybe he just hasn't. Like, he drew the line in the sand. Like, he Mm -hmm. drew that. He made that statement. And when he decided to say that, I was just like, okay, I'm not going to approach this anymore like, oh, you're a reasonable human being. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to approach this the way I approach a Bruce Goddard. This is the way I approach a fill in the blank with all the other scumbags I've covered on the show. Like, Wilkerson might I've said this before too, but like he might be quieter, 
But like whether you die by gas leak or a gas explosion, like you're dead either way. And mm-hmm. I think it, he might be more harmful than some of the bombastic, crazy pastors that you see going off in the pulpit. Like, because people buy into his shtick. And mm-hmm. so like, I'm, I feel very committed to exposing that, uh, shtick that he pulls when he stands in the yeah. pulpit. Um, Absolutely. you know, and, and then I, I do want to mention as well, I'll let you guys throw in if there's anything else relating to Treber's appearance there. Um, but later on, on a different morning service, he actually, I mentioned David Baker, who's partnered with David Hiles and Wilkerson said, Hey, I, I, w- I didn't do my research. I probably went and done the podcast. Uh, Wilkerson literally stood up in front of the, the, the church, held up a book by David Baker and said he read it. It was so helpful. And he asked David Baker to bring a huge box of books for everybody at the conference. Can I also just uh, give this pitch over here? Brother David Baker and Laura have raised 11 children, and I've had the joy to know uh, six of them casually, but uh, also watch them. And I really believe that uh, God has given them great wisdom, how to raise rich kids, rich relationships, rich life, rich finances. I asked him to bring a, a box of books. We put them at the Grace to Go counter. That is twenty dollars per book. I would love for you to pick up one of these. If you're a parent, I think this would be a blessing. You can go through these principles out of Proverbs with your family or purchase it for another young family. I think you'll be finding great blessings from that. I appreciate you, David, bringing that. That'll be at the Grace to Grow uh, table right out here to the left. They have a limited number, I think 24 copies of them or so. If you wanted more, you could talk to him about it, maybe a special day or whatever. I want you to get that if you would, please, as well. it will be a help to you. Even Baker, who he claimed to have no knowledge about his connection to, one of, one of if not the worst dude in the IFBs, really bad history, David Hiles, like he still decided to go ahead and promote him at the conference, which again, to me yeah. felt like a direct message to, I, I don't know. I don't know how to interpret that stuff. Like versus it's a direct message of, we do not care. Um, well, I think at, at some point you just have to take it as there's what they say and what they do and take it as they're doing what they're doing is exactly what they mean to do. It's in, yeah. it's intentional. Yeah, and and I think we constantly give them benefits of the doubt. Like, well, maybe they didn't know, or maybe they didn't, you know, get the information. But at some point when it's repeated behavior, you have to take it just as it is, as they chose to do this. It's very intentional and they know what they're doing. And there's a reason they're doing it. And that's, I think, to the point where I'm at, I'm like, like you said, it's, it, he knows what he's doing. He's, you know, not this obliviously nice guy, which I also will say is that anybody in that position of leadership doesn't get the um, luxury of being oblivious. Mm-hmm. That is not a luxury you get when you're leading a massive ministry business. You have to know, you have to be in the know. That's part of your job. And so, that's another part where I'm like, ah, that's a baloney <laughs> uh, being nice, but it's, it, it doesn't mean anything to me to be like, well, I don't know. It's like, well, you should know that's at the end of the day, you should know. Um, yeah, and know. we can, we can circle back yeah. to the infamous uh, p- uh, platforming, somebody with long hair, immediate, re- re- immediate reaction, a whole video. I am so sorry. This guy had an NIV and long hair. Recently, we had a creation seminar hosted here at First Baptist Church of Hammond. With all my heart, what I wanted to do is to educate and equip and empower God's people to face and to give ammunition for the fallacies of evolution and humanism that permeates our society. Though that was my goal, I I grieve to tell you that I probably did not uh, make the best decisions in many arenas. I failed to screen properly what was going to be said or shown in some ways. And uh, I think I hurt many people. I agree that I embarrassed the First Baptist Church family for 136 years been serving Christ and staying by the stuff. I think for the Hiles Anderson College students and the men and women who have sent their students here, I, if I sent an uncertain sound, I apologize and I sincerely ask your forgiveness. I brought Again. that up actually to Wilkerson. Yeah. I said, you made a video apologizing. Or maybe you did, Eric. One of us did you, about you did. Yeah. about 
a video apologizing because he had long hair. He was a creationist, but he had long hair, so you apologized. But you won't apologize for having people in your pulpit that stand up and protect pedophiles. Yeah. Like, to me, it's so black and white. There's no confusion here. I asked him very specifically to draw a line in the sand. And I think when it came to the conference, he did just that. He yeah. drew a line in the sand. It wasn't where I thought it was going to be or think it should be. But he drew his line in the sand. He's standing with all these IFB pastors and he's with the pedophiles. Yeah. So to me, he is no different than any of them. He's, I have no doubt in my mind now that he's different or not different. He's the same. He's yeah. exactly like they are. I had two strikes. I had long hair and I was standing against clergy abuse. So it's like two. He's like, one more, buddy. You're on thin ice. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean... I, to me, it's kind of like the shift from like the dog whistling <laughs> to just straight up bullhorn. Like, here's where I am. It's like, it's like Wilkerson would kind of again claim ignorance or say things quietly that you could infer something and you, you go, Am I crazy? <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, am I, is he better? Like, but now it's like, Yeah, like you said, it's he's drawn that line in the sand, which. I'm going to, now I'm going to repeat this a billion times. So I have to remember this comes from you, like do a little quote, <laughs> but, but it's, um, it is, it's, it's super clear at this point. It's super frustrating. Um, but I think for anybody now, I mean, going back in that black and white conversation for anybody hearing this, for anybody seeing this play out, like for anybody who just saw the Treber story drop and then sees Wilkerson praising him, like, if you're still sitting there, I don't know how to help you. <laughs> like, I don't know what more to show you or how it can be presented. Like, and I get if some people go, Oh, I don't want to hear it from you. It's like, well, you're not going to hear it from them. I mean, yeah. It's like, who do you, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's really frustrating. Um, and I guess the reason why to have this conversation is really because like, we have such a clear timeline of things that have happened. And in the course of three months, Three months to figure this out on their end, they did nothing and yeah. instead well, decided he, to double down. I think he figured out where his line was mm -hmm. and he drew it. That's what he did. Yeah. In the and, yeah. I, and I think, honestly, he's known since the day he walked in. I think a lot of times given him the benefit of the doubt. But if in 10 years nothing has changed, then this was your intention all along, I would say. I'm, I, I would say this is exactly what he intended to do from day one when he walked in. And honestly, probably the people who hired him wanted something that looked different, felt different, but was exactly the same. And then that's why they chose him. So, and and the thing is, I, I was able to bump into um, Eddie Lapina at the protest. When we did the protest, we were walking around um, and I, I said that, you know, I, he told me, um, do I know you? And I said, oh, my name's April Avila. He's like, I know you. I'm sorry. And I'm like, and I said, you're sorry to know me. He's like, no. And so I was just waiting. But even that, like, they won't verbalize. What are you sorry for? Like, what is this thing, this vague thing you're sorry about? But I told him, you know, like, you know, again, it's this very pastoral, hey, April, um, and then, but then I said, you know, like we're out here protesting the fact that you're platforming people who protect pred predators. He's like, no, we're not. And I said, you have Jack Treber in the, that's not, that's not what it is. And I said, we're taking it. Everybody who's out here is taking it as an endorsement of endorsing, like that you're okay with endorsing people who protect predators. And he just got frustrated and walked away. And again, it's, when I see that, it's it's intentional. That's all I can take from it. I'm just going to take it as their actions present it, that they know exactly what they're doing and they're okay with it. Yeah. They're okay with who they're platforming. They're proud of it, which is a whole other thing. Is there, and, and the thing too is that the IFB family tree is actually just a wreath. Everybody is connected. You know, we have Jack Treber, who's at Alan Domley's church just days before this, preaching alongside. Bruce Goddard. Like for me, that would be enough not to platform somebody. Like if you're okay being side by side with Bruce Goddard after his history of abuses in the church, the church, like you're okay with associating with them. 
Like, and then here, you know, Bruce Goddard's connected to David Baker and then uh, John Wilkerson's connected. All of them are connected, even and though Jack they want to say his, his uh, daughter's married to Larry Brown's son. Yeah. <laughs> he said that. Every, in it's, just like, it's just a circle. <laughs> and they want to be like, no, we're all independent. You can't, like you said, broad brush us, you know, make these broad statements. But I have to stand back and look and say, no, you are, you're very connected. You're like you said, you know, you're a friend to pastors or whatever. Like you're making a statement that we're all in this together and we're, we're, we're endorsing each other too. And so when I see that, I just, you know, I don't know. I like, I, again, um, I always want to be hopeful for change, but when I see this, I just see people who don't want it. And I, you can't really do anything with that at that point. Like if you're not willing to make those mental, you know, one plus one equals two, if you're not willing to do the math, then there's, I, there's not much else I can do it. And then one other thing, um, sorry, talking quite a bit, but yeah. there yeah. was somebody who reached out and said, you know, what, what's, what do you want? Like with Wilkerson, what's, you know, what, what are you after that kind of whole thing? And then they said, you know, if Wilkerson does, you know, tells Treper to step down, will you apologize? And it was just one of those things. Again, it's this right. exactly for what? And I, I, I just, it's again, solidifies to me that victims are seen as not only others, but as enemies of the church. Because if I'm trying to protect by not having a predator in a pulpit, why would I, by, but you know, by pointing that out, why would I need to apologize for that? Um, if anything, those people need to apologize for ever platforming that person. But it's again, it's seen as an attack that needs an, an apology. And again, and that was from, you know, somebody in the church that was very involved in the church. And again, it's just, when I see that, I see that the mentality hasn't changed in the church, how they handle people calling out abuse has not changed, how the pastor gets behind the pulpit and talks about it. Nothing has changed. And I'll, you know, I take it, I take that as it is. So, yeah. yeah. Well, oh, sorry. Did you have something you want to add to that? All I wanted to say was that the way that we have enacted change at Faith Baptist is by suing the church. Um, and I think that's what we need to try to do at First Baptist. I was not anticipating going to the protest and being triggered by a parking lot sign. And I just saw this old sign and was instantly right back there in that parking lot being abused. And I thought, why am I not suing First Baptist Church? I was abused here too. So I want to start a petition and have people sign it. We'll put it out on Preacher Boys. I'll put it on my Facebook page. April, you can do what you need to do in Hammond. And just see if we can get the attorney general in the state of Indiana to open a three-year window like Gavin Newsom did in California, where you can sue for clergy abuse. And then they lift statute of limitations. It's all civil suits. It's not anything criminal. But I think that victims need to be allowed to get justice in some form, especially when it was from a cult where you were handicapped on your way of thinking so that, you, you know, statute of limitations ran out. Um, so I'm going to work on that this week and hopefully we can push that out and get enough signatures to get something done. Yeah, I think that's huge. And and that's how the Treber, um, or the lawsuit against North Valley and Strofe even happened was literally that loophole of three years. And so I'd love to see that happen in, in more places. Um, I know there's plenty more we could, uh, we could rant about. I feel very ranty right now. Uh, but I am curious. I, I, one of the things I think is really funny. I haven't asked either of you, um, uh, what you think about this, but I love that Eddie Lapina, uh, says, you know, Oh, Hey, are you, who are you? And then Wilkerson is kind of like, Oh, who are you? You know? And all like everybody's response is like, Oh yeah, we know, you know, we don't know who you are. Oh yeah. We've heard of you. Um, do we think that the leadership of first Baptist church of Hammond has all seen, let us pray. 
Because I have a hard time believing they're not very familiar with who all of us are. I wouldn't say they've watched it in its entirety. I think they all know about it. And I think they know the players involved in it. Yeah. I talked to a pastor recently. Someone came knocking at my door. Got to love it. Living in Hammond, Indiana. Um, (laughs) Anyways. um, And so I had told him because he just, he would not go away. And I was like, hey, you know, I have this really great story that would really explain everything about my belief system. It's called Let Us Pray. It's this documentary. And he just got this look, his entire, and he said, oh, I, I started that. I didn't watch it, though, all of it. And we're like, you should watch all of it. But that's yeah, kind of, I feel like they're the same way. They probably started it, fast forward a couple parts, had their PR team. <laughs> David Gibbs watched, watched, watched it, it, took some notes. Yes. I'm sure took the notes, but I again, it's kind of one of those things. I don't, I don't know whether their curiosity is stronger or their need to be like oblivious, like right. purposely ignorant of things. I'm not sure which one's stronger. No, no. Well, whatever suits them is stronger, right? Yeah, whatever. I definitely them. think the lawyers watched it. <laughs> yeah, I, I gotta think they've all seen. Like, I have a really hard time thinking, but may I don't know. Maybe I'm just too hopeful i don't know added to the numbers you know can you be that cold-hearted and watch that (laughs) whole thing and still side with those people like i don't know i mean ask ask uh, what phil hudson the canceled preacher podcast but that's a whole other (laughs) that's a whole other story (laughs) so uh, i'm gonna get rizzo on for that one oh god yeah oh that is we should do a big episode on that um anyway well i i appreciate you guys jumping on i know that I'm sure this conversation will continue uh, over the next uh, next couple of weeks and months. Um, but I, I really appreciate you coming on, sharing your perspectives on this. I think it's a lot more effective than just me going, I'm mad about something and you know, shaking my fist at the clouds, yeah. which this would have been otherwise. Um, so we all got to shake our fists together and talk about this. Um, and And I know on my end, living here, I'm still like, I'm trying to do things immediately Right after the protest, I went to the police station and brought them information. I went to the mayor's office. And my goal is just to keep that. I'm going to just be that squeaky wheel for however Mm. however long I live in Hammond, Indiana. I'm going to be that squeaky wheel of, hey, you know, just FYI, these people are bringing people into your city that did this and this. So I brought the the lawsuit down to the mayor's office and everything. And I went down to the police station too. And I just hope, you know, if they're not willing to (laughs) redirect themselves, then, you know, maybe people with feet on the ground, boots on the ground, what's the saying, but we can do it, you know? And um, there's a lot of things I think that will be coming soon hopefully to get more action um yeah. from the state and all that stuff to hold people responsible if they won't do it if they won't hold themselves accountable then that's when i think you have to look outside outside the church yeah. and yeah. get some help boots, boots on the ground feels way too alpha I, maybe like cro- crocs on the ground or something we're gonna really be really extra annoying blocking around with so, um no I, I i appreciate mentioning that i think I don't want to dive too deep into that mainly because I'm trying to figure this out. I know we've talked about it. Like I think the next steps is really how do you be strategically a squeaky wheel? Like you mentioned, and how do you go into legislation? Like how do you get like, that's all pieces I really want to explore. And I hope people listening will kind of stay tuned for like, look, I've been doing the show for like three years and four months, three years and three months, somewhere in there. Like, um, you know, I started the show at 25, I think. So it's, it's, it's been a big part and there's been a lot of attention mm-hmm. and I'm hoping when the calls to action go out, like people don't just go like, Oh, I like liking stuff on Facebook, but I don't want to sign this petition or I don't want to go talk to this represent. Like, I hope that there's people there that will leverage that, you know, leverage the amount of people that are now talking about this to do some actual change. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that. I'm sure in the future, this won't be the last conversation. Um, but yeah, thanks again for coming on. Thanks to everybody who's listening to this. Um, if you haven't watched, let us pray, go watch that right now. Um, mm-hmm. if there's anything else you guys want them to connect with you on, I mean, that's pretty much the main call to action, right? Yeah. Sounds, sounds Perfect. good. So 
All right. A very human interaction to close it out. <laughs> I wanted to say one more thing oh, before you close it. Happy birthday, Eric. Thank Happy you. birthday, Eric. Not to rush and release this today. Again. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I know I look 45, but that's what this stuff does to you. Go meet with Wilkerson. You'll, you'll we'll blame all right. of your gray hair minutes. on Preacher Boys podcast. That's yeah. pretty safe uh, to do that. But anyway, well, thanks so much. And uh, we'll chat with everybody really soon.